Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Marsh. This has been called the Year of the Woman. How well have professional women fared? We'll take a closer look in a bit, but first, we go behind the headlines of an out-of-town newspaper that put its investigative lens on St. Louis. The Washington Post reports that a large percentage of women murdered every year are victims of their intimate partners. Over the last 10 years, about a third of the 148 St. Louis murders of women fell into that category. Making the matter worse, many of the incidents were predictable. Joining me to talk about it are Katie Zesma, national correspondent for The Washington Post. She wrote the story, and she joins us by phone. With me in studio is Anik Gardner-Perry, prevention education manager for Safe Connections, which works to prevent and end domestic violence. Thank you, ladies, both for being here. Great to have you. Thank you for having us. And thanks for having us. Katie, I'd like to start with you. If you would, just give us kind of the Cliff Notes overview of, uh, of your story. Sure, absolutely. So what we did was we analyzed um, homicide data um, of women in 47 major U.S. cities, and it was 4,484 killings of women. And what we found was that 46% of these women died at the hands of an intimate partner. What we did then was we closely analyzed the homicides in five of the cities, including St. Louis. It was Fort Worth, Las Vegas, Oklahoma City, San Diego, and St. Louis. And we found that 36% of the 280 men implicated in a domestic killing in those cities had a previous restraining order against them or had been convicted of domestic violence or a violent crime, including murder. What got you into this? Uh, you know, we have a, a year-long series where we're looking at, at homicide across the country, um, you know, looking, looking at rates, looking at clearances, looking to see where crimes are solved, where they're not. Um, you know, we had a, a story out of New Orleans about a woman who lost three of her four children and her one of her grandchildren to homicide. Um, and we really wanted to look at who was killing women. Um, you know, it was something that there's been some, there's been some research on it, but, but not a lot. So we really wanted to look to, to dig into it and see, um, you know, who, who was killing women across the country. And where does St. Louis fit in? Um, you know, so St. Louis, it's about, it was about 36%. Um, it was, you know, it was about in the middle, I'd, I'd say, um, you know, there were some cities that had had higher rates, some cities that had that had lower rates um, of, of homicide. Zanique, uh, this surprise you? It does not surprise me. No, we're um, really familiar with um, some of the legislation that Missouri has around um, domestic violence perpetrators and um, and their access to weapons and guns. Um, and from the report, just recognizing that 57% of women um, who are affected and murdered um, by domestic violence, they, their fatalities have been a part of gun violence. Um, and, of course, our agency primarily sees folks who've been affected by domestic violence and sexual violence. But we see these cases all the time, so we know how prevalent it is, especially in the St. Louis City area. What about the predictability quotient? Um, well, I think I think that I think there are a lot of um, there there are a lot of let's see what's the word I'm looking for. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of I can't think of the word, but it happens to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but we see this a lot because we know that folks um, there there are ways to tell when someone is going to be violent to their partner, mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons why we think that prevention education is really important because it's important f for women and girls to understand when they're working and dealing with and loving someone who could be potentially violent and um, and potentially put them in a, a situation where their life is in danger. So, Katie, what is your take on this, this predictability factor, if you will? Well, you know, it, it, there are red flags that, that, are, that are definitely there, but, you know, they can also be somewhat difficult to, 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 to see. You know, it can be, we talked to a criminologist who said, you know, it's very difficult to determine what actions might lead from abuse to fatal violence. You know, a number of people may exhibit behaviors that might be red flags for potentially deadly uh, attacks, but may never go on to kill. However, um, you know, these things that, that authorities and, and, and people who work with victims of domestic violence look at, they say they are, are predictive that could 
strike on the violence are things like filing a restraining order. Um, you know, that's something that could could set off the the abuser, and he could he or she could lash out violently. You know, potentially potentially fatal fatally. So, um, you know, another potential predictor is is a breakup. You know, again, something that agitates the person. So those are things that um, you know that authorities look for um, as as absolute red flags. But it, it's not always. You know, you can't say with 100 percent certainty that someone will do something or someone won't. And that's what makes these cases really some of the most complex that our society faces. Should we really be surprised by this? I mean, my understanding is that uh, most people who are murdered are murdered by someone they know, at least. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the same case, um, the same goes for rape as well and sexual assault. Like a lot of times people have this idea that that happens um, when from a stranger, but just like domestic violence and sexual assault, like those things have usually happen from someone who, who you know or someone who you're familiar with. I um, mean, another thing too, I think that there needs to be, um, so we shouldn't look at this as a problem just because of homicide or murder. Like domestic violence is a problem before it becomes fatal, bec before it becomes something that we are looking at and, and thinking that this person could potentially kill, kill the victim, you know? So domestic violence, um, it really ruins a person's life. And so we want them to see beforehand, the, see the red flags of, of um, an unhealthy relationship, something, a relationship that could be potentially like abusive and, and have you nervous all the time or have you um, feeling like you're, you're fearful for your life having that anxiety around just the fear that your life could be taken at any moment, even if even if the perpetrator will never take your life in real life. Um, I think that's still something to live with on a daily basis. It's a scary thing. What are thing. those warning signs? So we say that, you know, initially thinking about unhealthy relationships, there are cases where um, your partner who is doted on you and who um, has shown you all of this affection and admiration, um, eventually starts isolating you from your family and friends and, and saying that they only want to be around you and only you and that you, and, and have making up these narratives about the people that you love to separate you from them. So isolation is one of the biggest um, ways that we see um, abuse in, in unhealthy relationships happening, um, jealousy. Um, and then there's there's, you know, um, wanting your partner to be dependent on you. So the perpetrator will, act will actually try to make the victim dependent upon them financially, emotionally. It's, it's a control issue. Absolutely. Absolutely. Control is one of the biggest um, ways that you can see um, unhealthy relationships and abusive relationships forming. Um, and then, you know, you don't a, an abusive partner doesn't just start um beating on you and using their fists and hands, they initially start with their words and, um, and breaking you down slowly um, with disparaging comments about your body or the work that you do or um, your worth or value in life. Um, and then from there, then they may start using physical abuse, um, financial abuse, um, making threats to, um, to, um, uh, to your kids or even to your animals. So those are some of the ways that you can see a volatile relationship forming. And, um, and those, are the, those are the ways that we want um, students, when we're working with kids, to see how, um, how inevitable it could be that someone will turn violent on you. Katie, I'm sure this all squares with uh, the research that you've been doing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Zinique said it very, very, very well. Um, you know, it's, it's a huge reason why, why people don't report abuse. They should say as well, we say women, but men can, men can be and are victims of, of um, domestic absolutely. violence, domestic, hom domestic violence, homicide as, as well. Um, you know, they're, they're, from what we were told, you know, most, the quote in our story is, you know, most domestic violence victims are not cooperative. Many of them do not want to prosecute their abuser or see their abuser go to jail or be punished for what they did. And there are n numbers of reasons for that. Um, you know, as Anique said, it could be that the person is their source of financial support. It could be that they're afraid of losing their children, which is one of the women in our story. Um, you know, they, they love the person and that is Absolutely. an extremely powerful thing, you know? So there's just, you know, there's just so many reasons why women don't, well, they think things might get better. They have faith in their relationship, you know? So there's so many reasons why women don't, don't report and don't want to go forward 
forward in prosecution. And what we're seeing now, um, you know, on the, the on the, the law enforcement side is that a number of um, you know agencies around the country are now starting to intervene much earlier in these relationships. You know, basically saying to the woman, you he he could kill you. There's a very good chance he could kill you, and getting that across to her because most women under the underestimate the amount of danger that they're in. So having that done, and another thing that they're doing now is looking after these homicides happen, you know, kind of sitting around and saying, where did the system go wrong? Where can we try to intervene a little bit earlier? Where can we do better? And you're trying to, trying to do that, you know, essentially trying. And another thing that they're doing is going forward with prosecutions. If a woman says, I don't want to prosecute, the prosecutor will say, I understand that, but we're going to go forward with this prosecution regardless, um, you know, using medical evidence and using witness statements and that sort of thing. Because even if you don't want to prosecute your boyfriend, we think he is a potential danger to you in society. I, I think, uh, Zanique, you and, and Katie have already answered the question, but the question always asked is, why don't women walk away from right, this thing? Right, right. Why does she stay? Yeah. Why why doesn't she leave? That is always, um, that's a huge question that folks ask. Even families, friends, um, you know, they turn their backs on victims of abuse because they don't understand why do you keep returning back mm-hmm. to um, this cycle of abuse. And, um, and and one of the things that Katie said was that, you know, the victims, actually, the survivors, they often love their partners. They're hoping that things will change. They, at the beginning of a relationship, you know, a perpetrator doesn't start out, like I said earlier, they don't start out using their hands. They don't start using physical abuse. They're actually loving and admir- admiring and um, and really doting on their partner. And, um, and victims of domestic violence, they often want to return back to that that time when they've had those really sweet moments and they remember those moments and and usually perpetrators are manipulative and they know how to um, they know how to um, have their their partners believe that they will that they're going through a hard time this isn't something that they're going to be doing consistently and they will return to that great person they were at the beginning of the relationship they, don't they often say I'm sorry I'm sorry absolutely. this won't happen again absolutely and it does happen again. It, it does. It does happen more often than not. Mm-hmm. I'm well, take... The other thing I should say, too, is that um, it's very hard for a woman to leave. She has to look at shelter options. She might have to quit her job. It's not an easy thing to do at Absolutely. all. One of the things that I've heard in some of the research that I've done on this is that one of the worst things a woman can do is leave because that often leads to the murder. That is what mm-hmm. triggers the, the most violent reaction from the, the intimate partner. Absolutely. I think Katie could speak to this because it, she talks a lot about this in um, in the article here about, um, you know, m- most of the victims had had obtained restraining orders, um, had said that they were leaving, served divorce papers. And then that's when the perpetrator showed up um, and, and actually murdered the victim of domestic violence. Yeah, I want to get into that, but I have to take a break. So, uh, mm-hmm. Katie, stand by. We'll come back to that subject when we return. Mm-hmm. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Thank you for listening to this St. Louis on the Air podcast supported by University College at Washington University with undergraduate and graduate programs part-time evening and online. University College at Washington University offering world-class education within reach. back to our conversation about domestic violence with Katie Zesma, a correspondent for the Washington Post, and Zanique Gardner-Perry, Prevention Education Manager for Safe Connections. Okay, Katie, back to you now with regard to this issue of restraining orders and uh, protection orders. Uh, They do seem to be a trigger, as Zanique just told us. You buy into that? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, they're they're often seen as a potential flashpoint in the relationship where, um, you know, a woman takes that step to essentially wrest control back from her abuser, and the abuser um, does not like that and can and can lash out. You know, and that's what we found in, um, you know, a number of cases, including one um, in St. Louis. A woman named Sarah Jackson um, filed for a restraining order against her ex-boyfriend. You know, she claimed in court documents that he sent a series of threatening text messages and, and lurked outside her home. Um, she, you know, had taken all the steps she needed to do. She'd 
previously called police when he broke into her apartment. She had asked her property manager whether she could break her lease, hoping to, you know, escape with her 11-year-old brother. Um, and she, she filed for the restraining order, and the judge granted it, um, you know, the year-long restraining order saying that the ex-boyfriend needed to stay at least 2,500 feet away. And 11 days later, she was dead. Um, the authorities say that her ex-boyfriend shot her four times through the apartment window. The restraining order was actually lying atop a microwave just a few feet from her body. Um, and when investigators asked if Sierra Jackson had trouble with anyone, her brother actually handed them the restraining order. So, you know, that's one um, just tragic case of what happens sometimes with women when they file a restraining order. Um, you know, as, as one person we spoke with in the story said, it, it's not a bulletproof vest. Mm -hmm. um, a prosecutor asked women to, you know, suggest that women, when they file a restraining order, have a backpack and a plan to get out of town. It's, it's a huge kind of move on the, on the chessboard in this relationship, and it can offer often, you know, be the thing that, that, uh, that sets the, the abuser off. What is the difference between a restraining order and an order of protection? Um, they're they're basically the same the, the same thing. Um, you know, protect. Uh, in the, one of the issues, though, is that they you know un, they can't really they don't really do much until they're violated. So, um, you know, they're, they, they have, you have this order, but it's up to the abuser to comply with it. And th even then, you know, more mechanisms can't kick in until the abuser violates it. And sometimes that could be a case of fatal violence. But, you know, the onus is on the abuser to not break the order, but n nothing really more than the filing of the order. And if there are no other criminal charges that are pending against, against the abuser, um, can be done until this order is violated. Zanique, uh, the, the worst case scenario that Katie just gave us obviously mm -hmm. is the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. But I, I have to think that for the most part, because we don't hear of this so often, that the restraining orders are effective. Um, well, restraining orders are effective. Are effective. I think they're effective if they're doing what um, what um, Kim Gardner has asked the laws here in St. Louis to have um, to be implemented, where where they aren't sharing um, victims' addresses. If they're put into safe housing, they're not required, victims aren't required to share that information, which has formally been required of um, of restraining orders in the past. Um, and I think I think making sure the victim's safety um, and anonymity, anonymity is of utmost, yeah. anonymity is yeah. of utmost importance. Um, and I think that there are agencies and there are places and there are um, people who really care about women um, who work in the criminal justice system who are fighting to ensure that um, restraining orders or restraining orders are um, are of use and they are actually protecting the victims. Katie, what was the biggest surprise you had in doing research on this? Um, there were a number of surprises. I think the the biggest one was that um, the number is so high; it's forty six percent, and we think that that's low. Um, you know, we think it's low because a lot of cities don't give the full picture of their murders; they don't give all the information about what happened. Um, we also think it's low because we were told that it's probably low by people in in cities. For example, in Charlotte, I told them the number, and they said, "Oh, we think that's we think that's low." So, um, you know, if it's almost half in its low, um, that's an enormous amount of women that have been killed by their mm -hmm. intimate partner, um, current or former intimate partner. Another big surprise uh, to me was that authorities are now increasingly looking at attempted strangulation as a huge red flag for domestic violence homicide. Um, you know, the signs, of, the signs of, of attempted strangulation can be very hard to miss. They're not outward. They include... Um, you know, so, uh, bloodshot eyes, a hoarse voice, and confusion. And, you know, uh, people who work with victims of domestic violence and authorities now say that, you know, men who attempt to strangle women are extremely violent, and that a, a, a woman who is, you know, attempted, who, who's, who is an intimate partner attempts to strangle her is at a much, much higher risk mm -hmm. of being killed by, by that intimate partner because it is such a violent act. Anique, you're reacting here as if none of this is coming as a surprise to you. No, not at all. When you work in domestic violence, we've long known that strangulation is um, a huge indicator that a partner is potentially violent and um, in the relationship can be be fatal. Um, like when we talk about strangulation, it's a it's it's a form of control. It exhibits control. It's it's um, it's a it's um, 
it's violence with passion. So usually, usually the perpetrator really feels really passionate about this person, but he also wants to control them, and he has or he has felt like he's lost control usually. And in those cases, it's usually um, a great indicator that this person could be fatally violent. Right. You know, and to that end, I should add that we, another thing we found in our analysis is that many of these murders are extremely close and extremely violent. Mm -hmm. um, about half of women were killed by a gun. A quarter were stabbed. Mm -hmm. um, about 18 percent were killed with, you know, kind of no weapon at all, kind of blunt force trauma. And 6 percent of the women were strangled, which is a huge amount because less than 1 percent of all other murders occur by strangulation. Mm -hmm. Do we have any idea why why this uh, strangulation or the choking is, is is such a big part of this? You, I may have indicated earlier, uh, Zanik, that you think it's a form of control. Mm -hmm. It's control. It's it's passion. It's it's um, again, like Katie was sa was saying, like you know, it's they're really close encounters when these when these murders happen, and um, and that is you know when when a perpetrator is angry um, at their partner, like, you know, grabbing and, and trying to control that partner in that moment um, and losing control. I think a lot of times um, perpetrators are losing control as they're, and that's why sometimes tra strangulation, you know, we're able to see victims post-strangulation because the perpetrator realizes that he's hurting his partner and he doesn't want to kill her, but he also realizes that he's controlling her, or that control that he felt like he's lost. Um, he's regaining in that moment. K Katie, I don't know if this came from your story or from some of the other reading I've been doing about this, but uh, and, and you alluded to it earlier, and that is the the issue of uh, lethality assessments. Mm -hmm. That that is something that uh, is really coming into vogue now, p p perhaps and probably long overdue. Yes. What are they? So what so what a lethality assessment is, is if someone calls um, 911 or goes to a domestic violence shelter, we'll use the, the calling the police example, um, they call the police uh, because something, something has happened, um, the police will issue a lethality assessment. And what it is is a set of 20 questions that tries to gauge the amount of danger a woman is in. And each question is weighted with you know a number. And the higher the woman scores, the more danger she is in. So that is is used, um, you know, advocates say, because most women just don't know the amount of danger they're in. And if they are told, he's go he, there's a very good chance he's going to kill you. Like, to be told that face-to-face -face is much different than, than knowing things are bad or thinking things might get better. So what they do after the lethality assessment is they, you know, see how, where the, where the person scores, and then often uh, police departments will connect victims with services at the scene. They won't, they won't wait. They will connect the victim with services, and then once the victim goes into services, there's another assessment that is done to see how much danger she's in. But it's really kind of to say to the woman, this is the amount of danger you're in, and these are the steps that, that you need to, to take to get safe. Are we doing that here, Zanik? We are. We actually had a um, we actually had a survivor tell her story at one of our events in recent years, and she was saying that um, whether this police officer used the lethality se assessment or not at the time, because this happened a few years ago, um, this police officer knew based off how many times. Um, this victim had called the police department and they'd arrived at, at this particular home and what the police officer witnessed when he entered the home, he was the one to tell her, I think that you need to um, to get some services and, and look and see if you can um, find resources to understand um, how dire um, the situation is that you're in. And he referred her to Safe Connections and she eventually got help um, at our agency. But yes, I think that the lethality assess assessment is very helpful. And I do think that um, St. Louis is coming into a, a time and a place when they are doing that more. Uh, but I will say the police officers are, you know, they they have a lot on their plate as well. And we recognize that, you know, sometimes there isn't the capacity. Um, but but we also look at there, there are also ways that um, that their peer folks who would accompany police officers. And those are models that have been used in certain areas across the country as well. And I think that sometimes that could be helpful um, when police officers aren't able to actually do that because of capacity. Katie, in many ways, the domestic violence call is uh, among the worst that the police can respond to. Oftentimes, uh, I've been told over the years, the, the quarreling, fighting couple will turn on the officer. 
<laughs> yes, you know, police police do see these as as very as very dangerous calls. Um, you know, because there mm-hmm. there's you know, cause especially there has been um, if, if there's been abuse, um, if there may be a weapon, um, you know, it, it's something that that is is very is very very dangerous to them. You know, I've also been told that and sometimes they can they can be frustrating because they know that something is happening and you know and in like those cases, you know, the woman says we're okay it's actually it's fine you know it can be frustrating as well when when they know something's happening and they they want to get help but you know it's the woman necessarily doesn't want it and i think that's why now you're seeing more things like the lethality assessment you're seeing more things like um these what they're called evidence-based based prosecutions where uh these cases are being prosecuted with or without cooperation but um you know that is one thing uh for, for police officers is is that there is fear that these calls could escalate into violence mm-hmm. We have an email from a listener here who says that uh, she was abused. The police would not press charges against the abuser and, in fact, had them call her to pick him up, for j- for pick him up from jail. I wonder if that happens very often. I think oh. it does. I think, I think that those – I mean, there, there are police departments, police officers who really take these, um, these, these situations really seriously. And there are some who feel inundated by the work and, um, and very stressed out. I know you were saying earlier, Don, that you know when you did this work um, with police officers there, you found um, that some of them were um, complacent when it came to this and, and showed a lot of apathy. But I think that there are folks who, are, who do go out into the field and they really care about what's happening with victims. More, more so today than 10 years Absolutely. ago. Absolutely. No our time is winding down, but uh, and I'll come back to you, uh, Zanique, on this, and, and also Katie. What should a woman do who is being abused? What is your best advice to that uh, that victim? Absolutely. So like Katie said earlier, um, restraining orders and orders of protection are helpful and they're important. Um, but again, like when you when you get those documents, it is important to also do some safety planning. Um, and uh, we have a 24-hour crisis helpline um, that folks can call and, um, and you can call across the region and get support around that. And that number is 314. 314- 531-2003. We'll put it's, it on our website. Yes, yeah. and it's 24 hours, and, um, and our folks are always ready to help folks safety plan and think of ways in which they can safely leave their homes and get those orders of protection against perpetrators of violence. But they should take action. Absolutely. Right. Do, you, do you have a final thought on that, uh, Katie, as much yeah, as you know, what, what people should do? Yeah, you know, and I also think that we need to we need to recognize that this is a problem that cuts across every age, demographic, race. Like it it happens everywhere all of the time and I challenge anyone to say that they don't know someone who is in the situation or has been in the situation, and I think we we all need to have a greater awareness of that. That that this is yes, this is something that happens behind closed doors, but it is is incredibly prevalent, and um, you know we we really need to to get people the help that they need. Good advice, uh, Katie Zesma, correspondent for the Washington Post. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for the story; it's an important one. Thank you. Okay. And Zanique Gardner Perry. Prevention Education Manager for Safe Connections. We'll put information about your organization on our website at stopublicradio.org. Thank you for being Thank with us. Thank you, Don. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWNU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.